Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're gonna do a review of the refreshed GPD WinMax 2. Now I reviewed the previous model a few months back, but this one has an updated chip inside and then also an Oculink port here on the back. So we'll talk about some of those differences here in this video. Essentially, this is a laptop, but also gaming handheld hybrid. You can see it's pretty small. It's got a 10.1 inch screen, but then also has built-in controls as well as just all your other laptop stuff as well. So this kind of fills a specific unique niche, somebody who wants a very small laptop, but then also a gaming handheld and doesn't want to have those two things separate. So that's what we're going to check out here in this video is number one, what is the performance like on that new chip? But then also, how is it to actually use this device? You know, this is one of those where I didn't give it a super glowing review previously. I basically said that it's not super good when it comes to using it as a gaming handheld, but it's also not super good when it comes to using it as a laptop. And so in this video, I kind of want to dive into that topic a little bit more because I have been using this for about three weeks at this point and I've really found some things that I like about it. In fact, there are some use cases that I didn't really think about in the previous review that I'm going to cover here. Anyway, as always, we'll take some time to kind of get to the nitty gritty and figure out whether or not this device right here might be a good match for you. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, we're gonna start with some real quick specs. Number one, the CPU here is the 7840U. This is an upgrade from the 6800U that I had reviewed previously. Additionally, they've made a big upgrade in the RAM speed. We're looking at 7,500 mega transfers per second. And when it comes to storage, we have two different M.2 slots. One will already be pre-installed with your storage and the other one will be expandable if you'd like. Now the display here is the same as it was before, a 1600p resolution with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. And the battery is the same size as well, 67 watt hours and can also be charged quickly using a 100 watt PD charger. Now I didn't do in-depth battery testing for this video in particular, but I did find that I got between two and a half and three and a half hours of gameplay depending on how I was playing. And when doing non-gaming tasks, you know, things like just checking email and browsing the web, I got about six hours, so that was pretty good too. Now with a bigger battery, it will come with additional weight. So this is a little bit over a kilogram, so 2.3 pounds altogether. In terms of connectivity, we have a bunch of different options. We have an HDMI out port, as well as a full USB 4 port, as well as an Oculink port, which we'll talk about here in a minute. The operating system here is Windows 11 Home, and it also has two different USB-A ports, as well as a module that will allow you to use LTE access if you wanted to run it over 4G. Now this device was previously in an Indiegogo campaign, which has since ended, but you can still order through this page. And if we look at the model that I'm reviewing, which is the 7840U with 32 gigs of RAM, you can see it's about $1,000 altogether. However, there are cheaper and more expensive options. For example, if you want to get the lower spec 6400U model, this one here will cost you $800 instead. In addition, if you want to bulk it up a little bit more with additional RAM, you can actually get it with 64 gigs of RAM for $1,200. Now the 7840U is a relatively new chipset. I've only really seen it in a lot of handhelds right now. But after some digging, I was able to find one laptop with this chip. And the specs here are not super comparable. After all, this is a 16 inch display and also a 120 hertz panel that is OLED. However, my guess here is the RAM is probably a lot slower on this one compared to the WinMax 2. And you can see the price is still relatively high for this one too. This is $1,300. Now, if you are shopping around for a laptop, there are cheaper ways to go about this. Basically on Amazon, you can find plenty of gaming laptops that'll even have dedicated graphics card for cheaper. So if you're specifically looking for a cheap laptop to be able to have a lot of power, then I don't think the WinMax 2 is gonna be a great fit. After all, there are gonna be some compromises by having such a small size on the device. If anything, I would say the WinMax 2 falls into a weird territory where it's a little bit more expensive than handhelds, but of course it can do a lot more than those handhelds can. At the same time, it's more expensive than laptops, but it's also a lot smaller and leans towards that more handheld experience too. The way I see it, if you're a handheld enthusiast or a laptop enthusiast, you might think that you can find something better for cheaper. But if you wanna have both of those experiences at once, you will have to pay a premium for the GPD WinMax 2. Next up, we'll do a quick unboxing here just to see if anything's changed. Inside, we have a USB-C cable as well as a 100 watt charger. In addition, we have the GPD WinMax 2 booklet. This seems to be exactly the same as the one previously. Either way, I actually like their manual because it goes into detail about every single component. Taking a look at the WinMax 2 itself, yeah, it's almost an identical experience. Same feel, same look. It's probably exact same as far as the shell goes too. Really, the only major physical difference is gonna be here on the back with this Oculink port. It kind of looks like a small display port, if anything. 
Now, GPD designed this with another device in mind. It is the GPD G1. And this thing is really interesting here. This is a USB C dock that also can do Oculink. And in addition, it has a mobile GPU inside. It has the Radeon RX 7600 MXT. So essentially, in addition to being a USB hub for all your different peripherals, this will also boost your graphics performance significantly. And so as you can imagine, I'm very interested in trying this one out here, especially if it can boost multiple devices. And that's kind of the beauty about the G1 right here is that it is multifunctional. In addition to having an Oculink port, which is gonna give you a much faster data transfer, it is also compatible with USB 4. So all these hand handhelds that have USB 4 capability will be able to use this dock too. And personally, I'm a huge fan of this idea about external GPUs, but it is kind of clunky to actually implement. And that's what makes this one so interesting to me, is that it's both small and widely compatible. So with fingers crossed here, I'm hoping to get a review unit of the G1, and I'll be able to test it out thoroughly on this channel later. Anyway, quickly looking in the back here, in addition to the headphone jack on the far left, we have an HDMI port, USB 4 port, and then an additional USB-C port. We also have an exhaust vent here on the top, as well as our shoulder and trigger buttons. On the right side, we have two different USB-A ports, and then you'll find all along the device there are different speaker holes. I think there are four speakers on this device altogether. Not a lot going on in the front other than the power button, which also has a fingerprint sensor that actually works surprisingly well. On the left side, we have a full SD and micro SD slot, as well as a CMOS reset button. On the bottom, we have four different rubber feet, as well as two different 2230 modules, one for 4G and then one for additional storage. Also, we have our fan intake and then two programmable back buttons. Opening up the lid here, let's take a look inside. Now first, let's take a look at the laptop stuff, so starting with the keyboard. Now by virtue of being a 10-inch laptop, you can imagine here that the keyboard experience is a little bit cramped. But I do appreciate that they tried to put as much as they could within here, including a full function bar here on the top. All the same, yes, the typing experience here is pretty cramped. Now at home and in the studio, I use a 75% keyboard. This one here is called the Nufi Air 75. And I find this to be a really comfortable keyboard, but I'm also not super good at typing with this one here. Now I'm definitely not the fastest typer in the world, but I still remember some of my stuff. And so because of that, you can see here, I got about 64 words per minute. And this is just with my regular keyboard that I use every day. Now I was surprised to find that when actually doing a typing test on the GPD WinMax 2, I found it to be a lot easier than on my Nufi. Now I'm probably in a unique situation, but for about 10 years, I did type on an Apple keyboard, both on a MacBook as well as the Magic Keyboard made by Apple. And so as a result, I felt right at home with the GPD WinMax 2. And that's because the buttons here have a very similar switch and feel to them. And I was really surprised to find that I actually typed faster on this one than I did my actual keyboard. So in the end, yes, it is a pretty cramped experience, but I can knock out quite a few emails with this keyboard here. Now let's take a look at the gamepad controls. We're going to start with the analog sticks. Now these are small and inset. They're very similar in size to what you would find on a Joy-Con. However, these are using Hall sensor analog sticks, which means that they are magnetic and won't develop stick drift over time. And I think they feel okay. They click down L3 and R3. And when you're using them, it's still pretty easy to reach the shoulders and triggers. The D-pad here is exactly how it was before. This is basically a PS Vita style and has a nice soft click to it, very accurate and funky. To the right of that, we can determine whether or not we want the gamepad to act as a gamepad or also use it as a keyboard and mouse function. I'll show you more of this here in a minute. Now in the center, we have a trackpad. This one's on a hinge, so when you try to tap it on the top, it will not actually press down, only on the bottom. However, it will detect just a tap on it, and so that's what I usually do. I don't press down on the trackpad itself, I just kind of tap on it with my finger. To the right of that, we have our select and start buttons as well as our menu button, which is kind of like an Xbox button within the software. And finally, on the far right, we have our face buttons. These are very similar to a PS Vita as well. They have a soft click to them and also very shallow travel. I think they're a good fit for a laptop like this. Either way, I think that the controls themselves, as far as components go, are really well picked. Moving on to the shoulders and the triggers, I think these are pretty good too. The shoulders are wide enough that you can actually reach them with your finger without the hinge getting in the way. The triggers here are analog, but they do have a bit of a hinge pivot to them that I don't really like. It almost makes them feel a little bit mushy. Either way, I would say they're perfectly functional and all of the controls are easy to access. However, my main issue when using the GPD WinMax 2 are the ergonomics. And that's because by virtue of being a laptop, this is a very flat feeling device. When you're holding it upright, your fingers just kind of splay out like this and it just doesn't feel as comfortable as holding a controller. So when it comes to handheld gaming, yes, I would definitely prefer using something with real grips to it like the Steam Deck. 
And really, it's a pretty stark difference between the two, to the point where the Winmax 2 is kind of uncomfortable in handheld mode. Another thing I harped on a lot in my previous review that still feels really odd is the layout of the analog sticks D-pad and face buttons. As you can see, both of the analog sticks are to the left of the device, so the left one is outboard, but then the other one is inboard. And so for me, it feels really imbalanced in most control schemes. For example, using the D-pad and face buttons makes the D-pad feel a little bit weird. And then also using dual analog sticks makes the right analog stick feel just kind of weird and inset too. And so I found that just very basic things like, you know, using the D-pad to navigate around, it ends up for me feeling a little bit odd, like something that's imbalanced or out of place. Now there is a silver lining because there are certain games that play the best with this kind of setup. And that is when you're playing with a left analog stick for your controls and then the face buttons on the right side. When you play games like this, yes, it does feel perfectly balanced. However, in the grand scheme of things, I would have preferred to swap out the D-pad and the left analog stick. That way, both of the analog sticks would have been inboard. I think that just would have been more balanced for me, especially because I tend to play more D-pad centric games in the first place. Either way, yes, I do think the control scheme here is a little bit odd, but it's not a deal breaker for me. And finally, in the center here above the trackpad, there is a webcam. This actually has a 1212p resolution. So that may come in handy if you do plan on using this for like work conference calls. Speaking of which, there's also a unique trick that they have here on the Winmax 2, which I think is really kind of funny. They have these little magnetic plates that slide into the back right here. And these are basically concealment plates that you can use on the front. And so if you need to take the GPD Winmax 2 to like a work meeting and you want to conceal the fact that you're like a dirty gamer, you can just cover it up right here. And these snap into place using magnets and feel really satisfying to use. All the same, I don't really use these at all because I like to use the controls most of the time. But if you're going undercover and you don't want anybody to know that you're actually a gamer, this might be a great solution. At the end of the day, this is a very similar setup to the original Winmax 2. So if you want to hear more about that, I do go into more detail in my other review, which I'll leave linked down below. Next, I want to talk about ergonomics and how I've actually been using the Winmax 2. And it's interesting because it's kind of hard to find the right way to use this machine. For example, when I rest it on my lap, it works pretty well right here, but I also feel like the screen is just a little bit too far from my face, and so I have to lean down or like change the angle to make sure I can see everything. And I find myself lifting this device up closer to my face very often. The thing is, I can't really do this for long because my arms start to get tired. Now, of course, I'm a professional bodybuilder as well, and so it shouldn't really be that fatiguing, but for some reason, those 2.3 pounds really get to me over some time. So naturally, I've kind of found two different ways that this is the most comfortable for me. The first is to play it on a table, where I rest the very back part on the table itself and then kind of prop it up with my hands. In this way, the weight will actually rest upon my fingers, and it's a little bit heavy, but not too bad. I don't feel too squished. So in this position right here, I can play for several hours at a time. However, it's also kind of a weird feeling because I feel like I should just rest it on the table altogether and then grab a Bluetooth controller to have a more comfortable experience. The other position I found that works really well is laying down like this. And there's two major positions that work good for me. Number one is kind of holding it right near the pelvis and just kind of having it rest there. To me, this screen is so big that I can still see things pretty well at this distance. But if I want to have it closer, I found that resting on my chest like this is also very comfortable too. In fact, this is more comfortable than having it rest on a table and definitely more than having it on your lap. Now, another thing that kind of came to me about this size is that it really is a pretty darn small handheld, all things considered. If you look at it compared to my Steam Deck with the Kill Switch case on it, the Steam Deck is not that much smaller altogether. And when you look at the thickness, there's also not a huge difference here. Now, I would say the ROG Ally is more portable because it is shorter and not that much wider. However, even when it comes to thickness, they're pretty similar too. So when it comes down to it, porting around any of these three devices is a pretty similar experience. Okay, another thing I really like about the Winmax 2 is its screen. I love the fact that we have these really thin bezels around the sides. And the display itself is nice and bright, almost to a fault. For example, if we go at the very lowest brightness, you can see right here it is still significantly bright. I should also mention right here, the keyboard is backlit, so it's going to be kind of nice to be able to use in a darker environment. All the same, yes, this is a very bright display right here. It's going to be great to be able to use in a daylight situation, but not so great in like perfect dark. Okay, next I want to talk about the two apps that came with the device already preloaded. The first one here is called Motion Assistant. Now this is a third party app, but it's been tuned up to work perfectly with the Winmax 2. And within here you have a wide variety of options. For example, you can set a TDP limit, and they also have a bunch of pre-configured TDP options as well. 
In addition, there's quite a bit of customizability you can do. For example, you can set up keyboard shortcuts to be able to adjust your TDP as well as enable custom TDP options as well. And so this will be pretty handy if you want to be able to adjust things on the fly without having to jump into a menu. Additionally, within here you can adjust things like the resolution as well as the refresh rate of the screen, which runs at 60 Hz. Now the other app is called Wind Controls, and I think this one is made by GPD. And there's two major things you can do here. Number one, you can set up those back buttons that we have at the bottom of the device. And you can basically map these to whatever you would like depending on what game you're playing. The other option is you can configure the keys when you have the device pushed over into that mouse mode. And this will be really great if you're playing old school PC games that have a specific configuration from the keyboard. In fact, this is one of the best devices to play those older games because it has a native landscape display. Now for my part, I actually didn't use either of these tools very much at all. Instead, I used a different app called Handheld Companion. And this one's been out for a while, I've showed it off on other videos. And there's quite a few things you can do here. You can have it mimic an Xbox or a DualShock controller. And you can also set up things like gyroscopic controls as well. But what I like most about it is the sidebar that you can bring up. This can be enabled with any hotkey that you choose. And within here, we have all the same kind of functions that we have within the Motion Assistant app, but it's just a little bit handier to get to these because you can pull them up from the sidebar. And there's also some other features that are really handy and easy to access. For example, we can set a frame rate limit right here, and then we can also manually adjust the TDP anywhere from 15 to 28 watts on this machine. But by far, the one that I use the most is this one right here called Automatic TDP. And this is a function I've seen in a couple different apps, but I think the implementation is the best within Handheld Companion. All you have to do is just turn it on and then set your frame rate target, and it's going to take care of the rest of the work for you. And I'll give you some examples once we get into the gameplay here in a second. Now for my user interface, I mostly just use Steam Big Picture mode. And this is great because I can set it up with all my PC games to be able to access them easily. But then also I set up MU Deck for Windows and I recently made a guide about that. I'll have that link down below. And so within here, I'm able to access both my PC Steam library, but then also all my favorite emulated systems too. Now let's actually get into game testing. So within all of these games that I'm playing within PC, I'm actually gonna be using that auto TDP mode. And all I've done within here is just set the target frame rate to 60 frames per second, and then just started playing my games. And it's kind of amazing how it will regulate itself. So for example, with these lightweight games, I'm usually getting between five and maybe seven watts altogether. And so it knows right off the bat to just kind of take it easy when it comes to the power profile and so I can play these games for quite a long time. And as you start moving your way up to something that's a little bit more intense like a 3D game you can see that the TDP will boost up to about 13 watts altogether. Another interesting consequence I found by virtue of having a 10 inch display is that I've been more apt to use text based games. So something like Disco Elysium is not a game that I usually try to play in handheld mode just because the text ends up being really small. But on the Winmax 2, it's actually perfectly legible. So I think when it comes to games like this, maybe point and click adventures, real time strategy games, they're going to be a really good fit here on the Winmax 2. Now, one thing I did find interesting about Auto TDP is that sometimes it just went a little bit further than I was expecting. For example, when playing Hades, just at a regular 1080p default settings, we're getting about 17 watts altogether. And that seems like a pretty high power profile for this machine. I would expect it to be about 12 watts instead. And so this is a game where I would manually set the TDP to something around 12 watts and see how it performed. But I will say that for the vast majority of the games, auto TDP actually worked like a charm. In fact, often it would give me a lower TDP than I probably would have set manually. For example, when playing Control at 1200p at low settings, I actually was able to play it pretty well at 15 watts. Now there are a couple consequences of using auto TDP in that you will get some dips here and there below 30 frames per second. And what will happen here is if there's a moment where there's just a spike in GPU need, the auto TDP is just kind of a split second behind. And so you'll get a little bit of stutter. And then right after that, you'll get a small spike in the TDP itself to kind of compensate. And then after a moment, it'll actually just regulate itself back to somewhere around 15 watts is what I found with this machine. Now for me personally, I am more than willing to forgive that if that means that I'm gonna get some more power savings down the line. 
I'm not the kind of person that really wants to fiddle around with the settings every time I'm trying to play a game. I'd rather just kind of use it as a set and forget. And for me, Auto TDP has been the closest that I've found to that regard when it comes to Windows gaming. So I'm pretty excited about this app and it's probably something that I'll be using more often in the future instead of trying to manually set it myself. And as you can see from a performance standpoint, these PC games are running great. Even Witcher at 1200p low settings is getting over 30 frames per second at a 15 watt TDP. Now in terms of functionality, there's a lot more that you can do rather than just playing it in handheld mode. For example, if you have an external monitor, you can use it as an extended display if you wanted to use this just for browsing or just using as a regular computer. And of course, when hooked up to that monitor, you could also just use that as your gaming monitor too. And this will allow you to max out the TDP all the way up to 28 watts. And so it kind of turns into a mini PC at that point. Okay, next up, we're gonna talk about retro game emulation. There were some interesting findings that I had within here, and a lot of it had to do with auto TDP. Number one, I found that when playing RetroArch, it barely ever went below 11 watts. Even when playing something like Super Nintendo, the average was between 11 and 12 watts, which seems really high. I would expect most of these games to be able to play at between five and eight watts altogether. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that auto TDP was really built with PC gaming in mind, which is more GPU intensive. And so when it comes to playing C CPU bound tasks like emulation, it just doesn't really seem to be able to keep up. And so I found when it comes to lightweight retro game emulation, the manual configuration is probably going to be better than auto TDP. However, when you start moving up to things like, you know, PS2 and GameCube, those standalone emulators do seem to function better with auto TDP. For example, when running Champions of Norath, one of the hardest PS2 games to play at a 3x resolution, it actually runs at about 13 watts, which is really impressive. It's a similar story with the harder to play GameCube games like F-Zero GX, also at a 3x resolution, it's going to be about 15 watts. And the nice thing here is that 4x3 content actually fills up a lot of the screen thanks to the 16x10 aspect ratio on the GPD WinMax 2. Nintendo Wii U is going to demand about 15 watts altogether for most games, but you should have some really smooth experience. Even playing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, we're getting about 35 frames per second even when upscaled to 1200p to fill up the screen. Now one interesting thing here is that if you max out the TDP manually to say 28 watts instead of the 15 watts, it doesn't really net you that much of a benefit. For example, with Breath of the Wild, maxing it out here only gives you about 2 frames per second more. But at the same time, this is going to drain your battery twice as fast as it would at 15 watts. And so in the end, I think that 15 watts is probably the way to go for most of these systems all the way up through Wii U. And I would say the emulator that benefited the most from Auto TDP was actually Yuzu, the Nintendo Switch emulator. If you've ever tried Yuzu out, you know that there are stutters here and there when it's compiling the shaders. But Auto TDP actually does a really interesting thing. Instead of making those stutters happen when it's compiling, instead it'll boost up the power profile to be able to compensate. And so, like for example with Link's Awakening, when I first get my sword and I start going through some new areas, you can see that the TDP is going to go way up to about 25 watts altogether. However, as all those shaders compile, it'll get to the point where it'll start dropping back down because it doesn't need to boost the TDP. And so after a while, it'll actually settle itself down to about 15 watts altogether. And in that entire time, I didn't experience any sort of dips or stutters. And so this is kind of the best of both worlds in the fact that we're not getting any stutters, but then also the longer you play the game, the better the battery life's going to be. But of course, not every game's going to play at a 15 watt TDP. Some of the more demanding games like Metroid Prime Remastered will hover around 22 watts altogether. For other emulators like the Xbox 360 one right here, I did find that it settled around 15 watts as well. And same thing with PlayStation 3 emulation. This one across the board just seemed to play at 15 watts really well. And honestly, that makes a lot of sense because this chipset right here does a really good job when it comes to PlayStation 3 emulation. Even when I try to play something that's a little bit more 3D and sandboxy, you know, like Prince of Persia, you can see we're still getting a full 30 frames per second, even at 15 watts. So when it comes to PlayStation 3 emulation, this is one of the best out there right now. Now, another thing I wanted to investigate with the WinMax 2 right here is whether or not it would run Botticera, which is a custom Linux firmware meant for retro game emulation. So in this example, I have a flash drive that has the entire operating system within. In addition, all my emulators and ROMs are stored within here as well. So all I have to do is just plug this into the WinMax 2 and then boot from the flash drive as opposed to the internal storage. And this one actually worked like a charm. I had no issues whatsoever getting this up and running. And so if you're looking for a nice seamless retro gaming experience and you don't want to use up the internal storage on your GPD WinMax 2, I think this is going to be a great solution. 
Not only does the interface just work really well and you don't have to sandwich it in like you do with Windows, but there are quite a few features that are better than the Windows experience. For example, the dynamic range of the brightness and dimness seems to actually be better right here. The dimmest setting seems to be lower than it was on Windows and it does seem to get brighter as well. In addition, it feels like Botticera has been built with WinMax 2 in mind. For example, it also supports touchscreen functionality too. Not only that, the power demands seem to be lower when it comes to low-end emulation. Now, unfortunately, I can't see TDP within Botticera, but you can see at least the CPU and GPU load. And the GPU load right here is about 50% lower than it was within RetroArch with this exact same game. Not only that, I think the CPU load is even lower altogether. So in the end, I think when it comes to playing lightweight retro games, you know, Super Nintendo, things like that, it's actually going to be better on Botticera. You're going to have better battery life than on Windows. And that's kind of crazy considering the fact that you do not have TDP controls within the Botticera side. Another benefit of using Botticera is that certain emulators actually work better here than they do on Windows. A great example is going to be the original Xbox emulator. This one runs like a dream on Botticera. Here I am playing at a 3x resolution and everything is playing really well. I've tested this chipset with Xbox on other devices and usually you can only get between 1 and 2x resolution. So we are getting a huge spike in performance as well as graphical fidelity when using it in Botticera. And it's a similar story with the Nintendo 3DS. Here I am playing Super Mario 3D Land at a 6x resolution. And other than a couple stutters here and there when the shaders are compiling, overall it's a very seamless experience. So if you do want to play either Xbox or Nintendo 3DS, then Botticera is the way to go. In fact, just considering how well it's doing with retro game emulation and how convenient it is to actually boot into Botticera itself, I think my solution here is to play everything all the way up to Wii U on Botticera. For those really high-end systems, things like Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo Switch, those I'm probably going to stick with Windows because those update really frequently and then also they're just really efficient there on the Windows side. Either way, in a nutshell, when it comes to emulation, you've got a lot of options here and I think they're all really good. Okay, as we start wrapping up, usually I talk about what I like and what I don't like about this device, but honestly, I already did that in the last review and not a lot has changed other than improved performance. Instead, today, what we're going to do is we're going to do two other categories. We're going to talk about whether or not you should consider the WinMax 2 or whether or not you should avoid it. To start, let's talk about the use cases where you might want to consider using the WinMax 2. The first example is going to be whether or not you want something that's all in one. So say you have a PC and you want to get rid of it, or maybe you've got a handheld and you want something better, and you don't want to have both a PC and a handheld. Instead, you want to just kind of do it in one and done. And I think in that regard, yes, you should probably consider the WinMax 2 because it does do both of those functions if they are important to you. I also think the WinMax 2 is worth considering if you do a lot of mobile work. For example, if you're taking your laptop with you on the go, like on the job, then this might be a good fit too. Not only is the laptop itself fully functional and very small, but then if you have some periods where you want to unwind, it might be great to have a gaming device on you too. Another use case I think would be helpful if you're a frequent traveler. So for example, if you take a lot of business trips, you're going to be taking this on a plane, things like that, it might be good to have just one device instead of many. Another thing worth considering is that this is the largest screen in any sort of handheld that's available on the market right now. So if you've ever felt that a 6 or 7 inch screen is just a little bit too small, then the WinMax 2 might fill that niche for you. And finally, I think this will be a really good device for those who are curious about an eGPU. Not only is this going to work out of the box with the G1 adapter that's coming soon, but of course you can also use it with any other USB 4 friendly eGPU solution too. Now of course these are some very specific uses, and so let's talk about some of those people who should probably avoid the WinMax 2. Number one is going to be those who already have a perfectly good laptop or PC. If anything, I would say the GPD WinMax 2 is more laptop than handheld, and so as a result it probably is going to have a lot of overlap if you already have a PC. On the other hand, if you already have a nice handheld at home, say a Steam Deck or maybe the ROG Ally, I don't really see the benefit of getting this device as well because it's going to be less comfortable than those. And if you're really just looking for a PC, you can find better laptops for a cheaper price. I also think the GPD WinMax 2 is not going to be a great fit if you consider yourself to be a couch gamer. By that I mean you actually are going to be sitting on the couch, because if you're laying on the couch this is pretty comfortable. However, if you do want to sit up and play a game maybe while your significant other watches a movie, then this is not going to be a great fit. I think that a dedicated handheld that's actually made for hands will probably be just more comfortable overall. And finally, I don't think the WinMax 2 is going to be a great fit for those who are very budget minded. 
Because all things considered, this is a pretty expensive handheld. And so unless it meets some of those criteria on the left, I have a hard time believing it's gonna be worth that higher sticker price. Now it's no secret that I don't think that I personally am the target audience of the GPD Winamax 2. After all, I have a nice PC and a good handheld, and I also consider myself to be a couch gamer who is very budget-minded. But I was also surprised to find that I did find a use case for me and the GPD Winmax 2. And that is that later this month, my wife and I are gonna be going on vacation abroad. And for several weeks, I tried to figure out what handheld I was gonna bring with me. In addition, I just assumed that I would have to bring my laptop to be able to get some work stuff done too. However, after a couple of weeks of using the Winmax 2, I realized that I could actually just use this thing instead. And so on this trip, I'm planning on just taking the Winmax 2 to both be my work laptop, but then also my gaming PC. Now, knowing me, I'm probably gonna bring something else like the Mio Mini, but all the same, it was kind of a profound moment where I realized that the GPD Winmax 2 could do both of those things. So I'll definitely give a nice report when I get back from my trip just to see how that whole experience went. In the end, I think that the Winmax 2 is a really interesting device, but it may not be a great fit for you. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you have a Winmax 2 and what kind of use case do you use it for? Or are you interested in picking one up and how are you planning on using it? Also, if you don't plan on getting one, I'd love to know about that as well and why. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.